Calvinists, I have the perfect verse for you to use when discussing total inability. But wait, you can't use it. Christianity says Jesus will torment billions of people forever. That's a long time, and that's a long time. Don't swallow their lies or their tiny Jesus. Biggestjesus.com Yeah, size matters. For those who don't know theological terms, a Calvinist is a Christian who follows the teachings of John Calvin, whom the Calvinists say got his teachings directly from the scriptures. And they have a whole system of teaching. We're not going to get into that. But pertinent to this video is they believe that God chooses who goes to heaven or who lives on this earth forever with God. And he also chooses who goes to hell forever, whether it's eternal torment or annihilation. So God is completely in control of that. The human has no say in that. Now, I would differ from that where I say the scriptures teach that Jesus saved all through his work on the cross and God is in the process of bringing about the salvation of all continually through his work based on the work of Christ on the cross. So the idea of total inability, which I do believe pretty much in line with the Calvinists on this, they teach that man cannot do anything and freely choose Christ for his salvation apart from God initially doing a work in that man or that woman. So it is God who has to take the initial step to save the person, to bring them into a realization of their salvation. Man cannot do this freely apart from God. And there are many Christians who believe that man can do this apart from God. I was watching a discussion recently between a Calvinist and a person who is not a Calvinist. The Calvinist said that man cannot choose God based on his own free choice and free will. The other person was saying that man can choose God of his own free will and his own free choice. The Calvinist was arguing for total depravity or total inability. The two are pretty much synonymous in Calvinist camps based on my research. And what that means, again, is that the man can't do anything apart from God initially acting. Now, there's one verse that was not brought up by the Calvinist stating that man was not able to to respond to God without God's work initially in him. And I was waiting for the Calvinist to use this verse, and he never did because it clearly and utterly supported what the Calvinist was trying to teach. But he didn't use this verse. And I'll show you why he didn't use it when I give you the part of the verse, because there's two parts to this verse, the part of the verse that totally supported his position, but he refused to use it. And this was almost a three-hour discussion. And this isn't just limited to this three-hour discussion. Now, obviously, I haven't seen everything spoken by every Calvinist or written by every Calvinist. John Calvin taught hundreds of years ago, and since then there's been thousands upon thousands of pages, probably thousands of books written from the Calvinist position. There's probably thousands, if not millions, of videos on YouTube on the Calvinist position. So I can only go by what I've seen and read through Calvinist literature, through their videos, watching discussions. So it always surprises me that they never use this verse, or at least part of it. But I think they know that if they use one part of the verse, the second part will be used against them. So here is the verse that I'm speaking about. Here we can see Romans 11.32a, and the a tells us that this is just the first portion of this complete verse of Romans 11.32. So if we look at 1132a, this is a portion of a verse that could be used by the Calvinist to totally support their teaching of total inability. For God locks up all together in stubbornness. That's from the concordant literal New Testament. For God has shut up all in disobedience. That's the New American Standard Bible. For God has committed them all to disobedience the New King James Version. For God did shut up together the whole to unbelief, from Young's literal translation. And for God hath concluded them all in unbelief, for those that like the authorized King James Version. And even if you don't like it, that's what it says. So we can see from this verse that God is the one that has done the locking up, 
the shutting up, the committing, the concluding. And who has he locked up? It says all, all together. And he has locked all together in stubbornness. Let's take a, a little bit of a deeper look at what the word is, the Greek word behind stubbornness is in the concordant literal New Testament, which is translated as disobedience and unbelief in the other versions. We see that the word translated as stubbornness, disobedience, and unbelief is from the Greek apatheon, and it basically means unpersuadableness. So this is not just God affecting and guiding and controlling the steps of a person, but this is God controlling and establishing the heart, the attitude, uh, the resistance of a person to the truth. God is the one locking them, locking all of humanity into this condition. So you may ask, why in the hell would God lock everybody in the condition of unpersuadableness? They're in a condition where they can't believe the truth. Doesn't God want people to believe the truth? Well, yes. Let's now look at the rest of Romans 11:32 and you will see why and it gives us the reason why God locks all in unpersuadableness. Now we can see the full verse Romans 11:32 in the same five versions. I've highlighted the rest of the verse that was not in our previous slide. Let's read the entirety of the verse in each each version from the concordant literal New Testament for God locks up all together in stubbornness that he should be merciful to all. So there's our reason why he locks all up in stubbornness, so that he should be merciful to all. New American Standard, for God has shut up all in disobedience, so that he may show mercy to all. New King James Version, for God has committed them all to disobedience, that he might have mercy on all. Young's Literal, for God did shut up together the whole to unbelief, that to the whole he might do kindness. In the authorized King James Version, For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. So we see very clearly from this verse that God has locked up all together in stubbornness. That's all people from Adam until the last human. Now this is obviously excluding Christ, the Son of God, who bought the salvation of all. But the reason that God has locked all together in stubbornness is so he should be merciful to all. So mercy is the key that unlocks those who are currently in stubbornness. And we'll take a look at a couple examples of how God used mercy to unlock, unlock people from stubbornness. 1 Timothy 1, 13 through 16 tells us of Jesus getting hold of Saul the Pharisee who was the foremost sinner. We can see what God did in Saul the Pharisee's life. Saul, who is persecuting Jesus by persecuting his followers, um, even to death, throwing them in jail, doing things against those who believed in Jesus. Starting in verse 13, I, who formerly was a calumniator, or another word for that is a blasphemer, and a persecutor and an outrager, but I was shown mercy. Notice that. Paul says, I was shown mercy, seeing that I do it being ignorant in unbelief. Yet the grace of our Lord overwhelms with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Faithful is the saying and worthy of all welcome, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, foremost of whom am I, but therefore was I shown mercy. There we see it again. Paul was shown mercy. That in me, the foremost, the foremost what? The foremost sinner, Jesus Christ, should be displaying all his patience for a pattern of those who are about to be leaving on him for life Ionian. So we see two instances within four verses as Paul is recalling God coming into his life, changing him, and we see twice he mentions that he was shown mercy. Mercy is the key of God, used by God, that unlocks those who are unpersuadable. 
those who are unpersuadable, who are locked in that condition by God, not only become persuadable, but are persuaded once they are shown mercy. Many think that you're shown mercy because of something you do, because of somebody that you are. Well, it is because of somebody that you are, but it's not because of a good act that you do. Let's see what Paul says after the first instance when he said, I was shown mercy. He said he was shown mercy seeing that he did all that crappy stuff, being ignorant and in unbelief. He wasn't shown mercy because he repented. He wasn't shown mercy because he decided to become a good guy someday. He was shown mercy because he did the things he did, the wrong things against God and Christ, in ignorance and unbelief. And he was shown mercy, the scriptures go on to say, that in me, the foremost sinner, Jesus Christ should be displaying all his patience. For a pattern of those who are about to be believing on him for life Ionian. So we see that Saul the Pharisee was shown mercy because he was ignorant and in unbelief and he did things that he wasn't supposed to be doing, but God showed him mercy. And we see in verse 14, along with the mercy, yet the grace of our Lord overwhelms with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Now that is a powerful four-way punch. God showing mercy, overwhelming with grace, with faith and love in Christ Jesus. There are those that say we can resist this level of grace. We can resist this level of faith and love that are given to us. We can resist this level of mercy when God gives it to us. Saul was a total and complete enemy of Christ when God did this in his life. He was locked in stubbornness by God. He was shown mercy and released from stubbornness by God. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, Paul, who we just looked at in 1 Timothy, is writing to the Ephesians, reminding him not only of where he was at, but where they were at and what God did with them in their condition of stubbornness. This, there's so much in this passage, I suggest you read it and read it and reread it, because it shows what God does with somebody who is basically beyond all hope without God, which all of us are beyond hope without God. But God is there. God is here. Let's read Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, and see if you notice some similarities to the passage we just read in 1 Timothy concerning Saul the Pharisee. Paul writes, And you, being dead to your offenses and sins, in which once you walked, in accord with the eon of this world, in accord with the chief of the jurisdiction of the air, that's Satan, the spirit now operating in the sons of stubbornness, among whom we also all behaved ourselves once in the lusts of our flesh, doing the will of the flesh and of the comprehension, and were in our nature children of indignation, even as the rest. Yet God, being rich in mercy, yet God, being rich in mercy, because of his vast love with which he loves us, his vast love with which he loves us, we also, being dead to the offenses and the lusts, vivifies us together in Christ. In grace are you saved, and rouses us together and seats us together among the celestials in Christ Jesus, that in the oncoming eons he should be displaying the transcendent riches of his grace and his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For in grace, through faith, are you saved, and this is not out of you. It is God's approach present, not of works, lest anyone should be boasting. For his achievement are we. That bears repeating. Verse 10, for his achievement are we, being created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God makes ready beforehand, that we should be walking in them. So we see some similarities here with the same words used, the same patterns from 1 Timothy concerning Saul the Pharisee. And obviously Saul, or Paul, in this passage in Ephesians 2, is lumping himself in with the rest of the Ephesians that 
were at one time sons of stubbornness. That's what we are before God shows us mercy. And we were all in this condition, every single human, because God, God himself locked us in stubbornness, unpersuadableness. But verse 4 tells us, tells us God being rich in mercy. Again, there is the key of mercy that unlocks us from the prison of stubbornness that God put us in. And it speaks of his vast love, which uh, Paul talked about in 1 Timothy. And he said, in grace are you saved. Again, in 1 Timothy, he said he was overwhelmed with grace. So we see that mercy, love, grace, and faith those four are in this passage just as they were in the first passage that we looked at concerning Saul. God does all of these things. He has to do all of them. We don't have reserves of this within us. All of this has to come from without, and it comes from God. He has locked up all in stubbornness so that he should be merciful to all, so that he will show mercy to all. And that is exactly what God has done. And what God will do for all who are and who have ever been unpersuadable. So Calvinist, I'm sorry. You can try to use Romans 11.32a, but I think it will come back to bite you in the butt. Because the rest of that verse shows clearly what God is going to do with all who have been locked in stubbornness. And if there are any Calvinists that have watched this far, I hope you realize that God does have a purpose for locking all in stubbornness. Now you will agree with me that he hardened Pharaoh's heart and he hardens every heart that has ever been hardened. In this verse, Romans 11:32a is proof of that. It is solid proof that God is the one that is in control of man's hearts. Whether they believe, whether they're not believers, all of that is of God. But I challenge you and I encourage you, Calvinists or any who are not believers, to look at the second part of that verse. God will show mercy to all. He will overwhelm them with grace, faith, and love. Because Jesus is the Savior of the entire world.